Okay, hello and welcome to another NAEA, Museum Education Division Peer-to-Peer -peer Google Hangout. Um, thank you for joining us today. Our topic today is taking risks in gallery teaching. And um, before we turn it over to three panelists, I wanted to go over a few quick reminders. Um, if you are, if you're observing, um, like I said, there'll be three speakers who will be sharing different types of risks that they're taking in gallery teaching. But this is meant to be very interactive for all of you that are viewing. So please use the um, Q&A or question and answer feature where you can type in questions or add comments along the way. Um, feel free to type them in and send them. Also, if you see in the Q&A as we go along that someone else has posed a question or shared an idea that you think is really great and should be highlighted or you would like the panelists to address, just click the plus one button where um, that'll raise it up in the ranks so we'll see that that's um, a question for a larger group of people and we'll try to get to those as well. And I also just want to introduce myself really quickly. I'm Michelle Groey. I'm the Director of School and Teacher Programs at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I'm also the Eastern Region Representative for the Development Committee, which is like the Leadership Committee for NAEA's Museum Education um, Division, and we're delighted that you are joining us today. Like I, um, so we were saying, Peer to Peer is a monthly Google Plus Hangout series where we get together with other colleagues, we share ideas, we sometimes debate them. Um, it tends to be very lively in terms of our conversation um, and we hope that you will um, join us today and sharing your ideas and questions as we go. So we have three panelists. Um, like I said, they will each share how they are taking risks in gallery teaching and I will turn it over to them to introduce themselves. So thanks again for joining us. And Teresa, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um, hi everyone, my name is Teresa Soto. I'm Assistant Director of Academic Programs at the Hammer Museum. And here I oversee educational programs and interpretive programs for K-12 students and teachers, families, and university audiences. And then I'll pass it over to Rachel. Okay, um, hi, I am Rachel Ropeek. I am the Teacher Service is coordinator at the Brooklyn Museum and I oversee all of the professional development programs that we do for K through 12 teachers. To Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Yi and I am a tour guide at Museum Hack and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about Museum Hack in a little bit but we're based in New York City. All right, back to Teresa. All right, so I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Michelle Groey mentioned, we're each going to share programs that, in which we believe we're taking risks, and the majority of the time we'll have today is, is going to be conversation, so we'll just hear about eight minutes or so from each presenter. Um, so I'm going to talk about some ways that we take risks at the Hammer Museum, particularly in two programs, in a family program called Look Together, and a program for and with fellow museum educators. Um, but I first wanted to start with a little bit of context uh, for those of you who may not know the Hammer Museum. We're one of three public arts units at UCLA. So another public arts unit is the Fowler Museum as well as the Center for Art and Performance. Um, we're a museum that focuses on the art and ideas of our times and a museum that champions artists. The city of Los Angeles and LA artists in particular are very central to the work that we do. However, we also have uh, exhibitions of emerging and established artists from around the world. So innovation is really important to the work we do as an institution and one of the I think a great examples of this, a good testament to this commitment, is the fact that we have an entire artist council comprising only artists. So instead of having say a couple of artists on our board, we have an entire council dedicated um, to hearing from artists and really taking their uh, guidance and advice seriously incorporating it into a variety of our aspects of our work. Everything from thinking about artist wages to issues of diversity in both exhibitions and in staffing. Um, so as an artist driven institution, the Hammer as a whole values taking risks and surprising people. And that institution-wide emphasis naturally impacts the work that we do in educational programming. So one of my department's core values emphasizes the importance of experimentation and learning because I personally believe that one of the best ways to learn is to take a risk 
to maybe fail and to learn from your mistakes and apply what you've learned in the creation of something hopefully greater. And so in terms of one of the ways we foster experimentation, both among our staff and our audiences, is through family programs. So we began, when we started thinking about family programs in my department, it was fairly new. Um, we have launched two series in the past um, year, essentially. And so when we were first starting to think about what we wanted to do for families, we developed an impact statement. So that statement articulates how we hope families will be impacted by your programs. And that statement is, families will make meaningful connections to art, one another, and the world through experimentation and imagination. So really experimentation is, as you can hear, crucial to really thinking about how we implement these programs and what we hope that families will um, experience. So one of the family programs that we launched is a series called Look Together. Look Together is a one-hour guided experience in the galleries in which families are encouraged to experiment. And they will do creative and playful activities that engage them with works of art while in the galleries. But the crucial part about this program is that the activities are flexible enough that, they, that families can take them anywhere. And so they can learn strategies for engaging with art in any museum. It's somewhat of a how-to for parents. So the program hinges on filling the blank in the following phrase, how to blank about art. So we have had programs such as how to throw a party about art, how to play games about art, and how to make music about art. And from the program's inception to its implementation, experimentation has been really key to the design of the program. So in the very beginning, we knew we wanted to have a small-scale program. We wanted it to be facilitated. We wanted to encourage families to engage with one another and with works of art. But we weren't exactly sure how to do this. So we decided to call the entire series Look Together because it was broad enough to encompass whatever it was we envisioned. And so for one summer, we tried out various iterations of this Look Together program. And we told participants up front that we were experimenting. And so we were really transparent about the fact that this is a new program, that we were looking for their feedback. We gave them surveys at the end of each program to really help us think through what it is that would be, uh, that would work for us. And so, of course, we had some successes, some failures. One of the programs only had two participants. Um, and of course, although this was disappointing, we had to really be OK with that, because we knew that in taking risks, there are always the uh, possibilities of, of failure, right? So uh, we learned about what worked and what didn't work in this process. And ultimately, we decided that the program of how to blank about art was the best direction for us. So how do you throw a party about art, for example? Um, like many parties, first you consider what you're going to wear to your party. Um, then you maybe meet other party guests, and perhaps there's some dancing. So I'm going to show a few pictures from this program just to give you a taste of what it was like. And bear with me as I pull that up. OK. And I am sharing right now. So hopefully on your screen, you should see two images um, very shortly, if not already. And you'll see that on the left, there is an image um, by Max Ernst. And on the right, there is an image by Jennifer Bornstein. These were two images that were in our apparitions Portages and Rubbings exhibition, which is an exhibition that featured the art and the technique of frottage or rubbing to rub and, and rubbings. So on the left here, you can see how Max Ernst has taken various household items like a comb, which you see along the spine and the sort of ribs of the surrealist creature, and then rubbed that comb to create the body as well as various other parts. Um, and then on the right, there's an image by Jennifer Bornstein. She has rubbed a camera that belonged to her father who had passed away. So these are just a couple of examples of that exhibition, but we were really inspired by this technique and thought that it would make really great party hats. So here are a couple of pictures 
um, from some of the participants that came to this event and they posted a blog post about their experience. Um, it's a company called Lasomi that this blog post appears on. So I have to thank them for sharing these pictures with everyone. But here you see that the families are engaged with uh, this art of, of rubbing, a frittage, to make designs and details on their party hats. So now they've donned their party hats, as you can see down here. And then they are introduced to the guests. So now you see um, a couple of the families working together to be introduced to our guests, which are our hammer portraits, the portraits in our hammer collection. And so we had an activity in which they had to really think about who these people were, what their jobs might have been, um, their personalities, what their favorite music might be like. And then they had to introduce their guests to other guests at the party, meeting other families. And then the next part of this activity was dancing. So we had the good fortune of having these chairs called spun chairs in uh, our space, which is currently part of an exhibition called Thomas Heatherwick Studio. And so Thomas Heatherwick Studio designed these really fun rotational, rotational uh, chairs. And then one of our student educators, who you see at the upper right hand, upper part of the picture, is doing some dance movement inspired by the chairs. So, as you can see, um, it's a pretty fun and engaging experience. And then the parents walk away with some tools for how to engage with their kids in a fun way in any museum. So that's one activity um, that we shared. I just stopped sharing that, so hopefully I'm back on the screen here. Um, so that was one thing that we did. It was a, a program that we continued to experiment with because I mentioned just sort of briefly that we work with student educators. They're all UCLA students. So we work with them to come up with new ideas for this program all the time because we have to fill in that blank, right? How to blank about art. And so we're always trying something new and sometimes it works and some beautifully and sometimes um, there are things that we need to learn to improve them. So that's one. Um, the other program I wanted to talk about is a program in which we work with fellow museum educators across Los Angeles. So this is a program called Gallery Teaching Lab, and we launched this just in October, so it's pretty new. Uh, for this program, we wanted to create a really safe space for museum educators to experiment with our teaching practice without any constraints. So experimenting without having to justify a particular direction or audience, without having to report attendance figures, without needing a clear idea about what the practical application might be. So in this program, we convene museum educators from different institutions across LA County, and so far we've had about seven institutions participate. Uh, every six weeks we gather, and we are, um, everybody takes turns facilitating some kind of experiment. And it's, um, it has been a really amazing experience so far. There's really only one rule. The rule is that you can only test something that you've never tried before. So it really encourages us to think outside of the box. It encourages us to um, really think about our practice and take a step back from our practice. And also it helps us to, um, to really kind of have the opportunity to to try something that really doesn't have necessarily a programmatic impact. Um, so in other words, we have had some experimentations that will just be experimentations and maybe that's enough and that's okay. Uh, and in some cases we've had experiments that were actually useful for for actual programming. So people did incorporate some of the experiments we did. So for example, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. One experiment we did was from a colleague at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Veronica Alvarez. Um, if you're here today, hello. Um, she led a silent conversation about sensitive topics explored in a work of art by Robert Heineken. So I'm going to go ahead and share that work briefly um, with you again. So hold on one moment. And... So hopefully on your screen you should see this work by Robert Heineken that features a, a kid with a toy gun um, and there's an ad for this toy 
juxtaposed with an ad of a replica of JFK in a rocking chair. So that was the image that we were working with. And Veronica did this really great um, silent conversation because knowing that this work of art could have very sensitive, controversial topics like gun control, um, consumerism in the US, she created this document that we were all to respond to. So these big pieces of paper that say, what are your thoughts, ideas, questions about gun culture in the US? And then everybody that was present could respond to it and silently. So it was partially anonymous. You could write whatever you were thinking. Um, but people were, you know, um, it was people knew who was in the room, but you could still have the freedom to say something that maybe you wouldn't say otherwise. So one of the ones here says, I have a huge bias against gun ownership, um, such that I'm not a good listener to those who advocate for guns. So clearly there's a lot of sort of honest responses to this um, type of activity. So um, in that case, this program is, has been really very um, wonderful, not just in terms of experiments, but in also networking and really kind of getting comfortable with one another in Los Angeles with the various institutions that are involved um, I'll share one other ex example. In another gallery teaching lab, a colleague at a museum in El Segundo called Esmela, her name is Chelsea Hogan, tested the common museum education practice of drawing what we see when we look at a work of art and really emphasizing that it doesn't have to be perfect. But what if it does have to be perfect? What would that do? So the activity was you have to draw something perfect, and then you have to draw it more perfect, and then you have to draw it more perfect, and for the fourth time, the most perfect you could ever draw it. So um, very interesting results as well for that, for that activity. Um, some people were very upset by the activity, and some people um, really thought that it got them to understand something very crucial about the works of art. So um, those are just two quick examples of, of programs in which we really foster risk-taking at the Hammer Museum. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rachel to talk about how she um, takes risks in her institution. So that's great, Teresa. Just before we pass it over to Rachel, I just wanted to highlight a couple quick questions that have come in from, from what you were sharing. Um, one quick question was, um, is the um, is the impact statement that you talked about for the Hammer Museum uses, is, is that available on the um, museum's website? That's a great question, and um, it isn't. But I think that is something that we should really incorporate in some way. We weave it into our descriptions of our programming. So, you know, as we, when we talk about Look Together, for example, we do say what we want uh, parents to experiment and families to experiment, but we don't have that specific statement online. Okay, and then um, just I'm going to do two quick ones really quickly here. So um, Chelsea in Milwaukee was asking if there are, are gallery teaching lab branches in other areas because it sounds like a great idea. So wasn't sure, weren't sure if you had it, um, if you had an idea if, if other types of gallery teaching labs exist in other locations. Yeah, but I'd be curious to hear anyone that's participating. We Thank have you. one. We have one at Brooklyn, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Okay, great. And if anyone who's watching, if you have one in your area, give it a give it a plug or a shout out, and please add that to the Q and A. And last question, really quickly for you, Teresa, is um, Mark is asking, do you provide the questions that you use for the guest portion of the activity to the parents because he's interested to know if the prompts have been designed by the museum staff? Um, we do provide the questions. I just to clarify, is that the questions of um, introducing the guests or the museum? Um, the portraits in the museum, that's right, Mark? Well, I, I'm going to assume that that's maybe what you're talking about. And in, in that case, we did provide those prompts to the, um, I realize I'm still sharing that, my PowerPoint. That's thing. okay. Um, so we do provide them to them. And then we also, at the end, at some point, um, we'll put it online. So they also have that. In terms of whether or not it's being designed by museum staff, it's very much a collaboration between the museum educators that are full-time and the student educators who are UCLA students. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Teresa. So now we'll pass it along to Rachel, and I will set up the screen share while you give a quick intro, Rachel. Sure. Um, cool. So I um, will talk a little bit about some of the programs that I run. So I, as I said at the beginning, I am in charge of all of the range of professional development opportunities for teachers. Um, K through 12 mostly and one of the things that I have been really getting interested in is the idea that uh, especially now in a time when teachers um, are stressed and have lots of expectations and testing and common core standards and all of these kind of buzz phrases uh, that, that maybe they just want to come to the museum and enjoy themselves in the museum as individual adults not always only with the hat on of teacher, educator. So what I've been trying to do in my programs is to really emphasize that piece of it more and then let them find the ways that that can connect to what they do in the classroom. So I have a range of different programs which I don't need to go into extensive detail but they range from kind of one-off drop-in free programs all the way up to like six-day full-day uh, teaching institutes where they have to pay and they get professional credits for it um, and so there's a whole range but what I'm trying to incorporate into as many of those programs as I can is sort of unexpected fun activities for teachers to do in the museum on their own. So a couple of examples of that and um, the first couple of slides, Michelle, if you can pull those out. Michelle is helping me out because I am in a corner of the museum right now with bad Wi-Fi. So this is a teacher who um, was doing, I had it was a gallery bingo game, um, which I know other people have done as well, but this was at a drop-in event that was an open house and I was really trying to encourage them to explore the museum freely on their own. Um, and then if you head on to the next one, yeah, so this one was a kind of choose your own adventure style where uh, we had a concierge who was one of my fellow educators, shout out to Samantha Serrano who helped me out with this. Um, concierge and she had these little packets so there were packets of index cards and you're seeing some examples of them here on the screen and basically people came in and told her what mood they were in and how they were feeling oh can you just go back one Michelle yeah thank you um, they kind of came in told her how they were feeling and then depending on what they said she put together these packets of cards that were around that mood so we had um, like the one on the right I think came from an immersive theme if people wanted to really kind of go into parts of the museum that would immerse them in something and the one on the left was for people who were feeling energetic and participatory and it kind of gave them actions to do. Um, so that's a couple of examples and then the next picture, Michelle if you will move on to that, thank you for being my uh, helper here. Um, this is an activity we did that was based on an artist, a contemporary artist, who part of his practice is to ask people to draw maps from memory to specific locations. And so the theme of this program that I had teachers there for was refresh and reinvigorate. And so I asked teachers to draw from imagination or memory a map to a place that they could find refreshment and reinvigoration. And then they had to lay their cards out like this on the floor and try to make them connect so that it was kind of this imaginative map to refreshment and reinvigoration. So, okay, so thank you, Michelle. You can take off the slide sharing. I will share the one last one later. Um, but one of the things that has been really nice about that is seeing how excited the teachers get when it's their time to experiment and have fun as adults, and I think um, that is a spirit that then helps them feel like they can take that creativity and take it to the classroom. And that's the way that I've started to do teacher programs is we'll spend some time participating and doing these activities, whatever they may be, and then at the end I leave time to have a discussion with the group about ways in which they might 
bring all of these ideas to the classroom or bring some of these ideas to the classroom. And what I have found is that that is actually their ideas of how they would bring things to the classroom are much more creative and a much wider variety of ideas than I would come up with if I were doing a section of the program that says, yes, then you could do this mapping activity with your students by XYZ. So I've found that it's really kind of um, getting an impressive amount of creativity out of them, and it's certainly something that has worked out well. I mean, I've been um, dealing with oversubscribed programs recently, which is like a, a, pro a problem we would all like to be having more, I imagine, but um, that's been really great. So um, to get at um, one of the things I was going to talk about kind of connects to the teaching lab idea that Teresa was talking about, and that is that um, we also have just, it's internal at the Brooklyn Museum, so we don't work with other colleagues in other institutions, but we do have, it's called teaching lab also, um, and it's different educators. Um, right now we're doing it about once a month. It's different educators each month highlighting something that they have been working on. So it doesn't have to be brand new but it's letting each of us kind of bring a topic that has been of interest to us to our wider department. And actually, half an hour after we end this Hangout today, I am doing a teaching lab with my colleagues that is specifically about taking risks and experimenting in galleries. So, you know, stay tuned. Um, I have, we're, we're gonna be making gifts for artwork, we're gonna be creating labels for unrecognized artwork, as in objects that are around the museum that are not really art, so maybe the water fountain or the door or something like that. So we'll be creating labels for those, and um, we'll be doing some movement activities. So I, um, I'm trying to kind of take the spirit of what has been working really well with teachers and also use it to share with colleagues and, and hopefully encourage my fellow educators to try some experimental things. Maybe they won't all work, maybe they will, but that that spirit of experimentation, like Teresa was saying, is really a nice one to play with and to bring in. Um, so that is, so if you can, Michelle, if you can put up the last picture that I have in there, which is a couple of pictures of teachers at recent events um, doing some of these experimental things. The upper left was one where they were doing a participatory walk through the galleries guided by an artist and um, making some animated facial expressions and gestures. And then on the lower right, I had teachers who were um, doing an activity. This was facilitated by one of my colleagues, but it's connected to an exhibition we have of Judith Scott's work, which is a lot of, um, kind of combining materials and wrapping and bundling and kind of almost like crochet techniques. And so they had to sort of wrap up each other and um, participate in that. So you can take screen sharing off, Michelle. That was it for my slides. Thank you. Um, and I am going to kind of wrap up my piece. My little eight-minute timer has, has gone off. Um, so I just want to kind of make the, the final point that it's been really interesting to see as I have both tried to be experimental in my programs with teachers, um, see how that is received, and then also see the kind of extended creativity that it seems to provoke in teachers about the range of ideas that they're coming up with for things to do with their students in ways that I never would have thought of. So I will stop there, and I will turn it Great. on to Michelle. Yeah, so there are two Michelles, which adds confusion yeah, to this sorry. Hangout. Thank but um, I just want to chime in really quickly before we go to Michelle, he, that Rachel, you have a, a quick question where um, kind of talking, building on what you were just talking about in terms of um, Zoe's asking, have you been able to follow up with teacher participants to see how these great ideas are actually implemented in the classroom? Yeah, so I have, um, in some of my programs, yes, and in some of my programs, no. Um, so the ones where it's a drop-in free event and people come, I don't have an easy way of staying in touch with them. But in the programs where I do get to see them over an extended period of time, like for example, I have one program where um, the teachers, I see them over the course of the year, they're art teachers, and we actually have an online it's sort of like a private Facebook group, but it's not actually through Facebook, and they do share pictures 
and anecdotes and stories and lesson plans there. So I do get to see what they're doing in the classroom. And similarly, for some of my ongoing courses where I'm seeing the teachers again and again, yes, they are kind of bringing back stories at other sessions and um, sharing how these things go over. And one of the things I found is they're not necessarily doing the entire activity the way we've done it in the museum, but they're adapting it for whatever their subject is, or they're taking one piece of it for their subject or co to connect to their unit. So. Okay. And then another quick follow-up to that, um, just um, before we move on to Michelle, is uh, Melissa is asking if you do the work in terms of addressing state or national standards in terms of the gallery activities, or if that's something that the teachers come up with on their own, um, or are you aligning your own teaching with some of those bigger concepts? Yeah, um, sort of some of all of the above, I would say. Um, I don't necessarily sit down with like, I have the window of the Common Core State Standards up on one side of my screen and my lesson plan on the other. Um, but what we do talk about a lot in all of my programs is how especially um, some of the thinking about Common Core, for example, um, and I apologize for construction noise in the background if that is making its way through. They're renovating our space. Um, some of the things that we emphasize are the larger, like the anchor standards for the Common Core. So we're not necessarily digging into the real specific things, but we're talking about like, oh, well, this is great for finding evidence to support your conclusion, or this is great for being able to pull information from a number of different sources, that kind of thing. So I would say sometimes I will bring that up. But more often, I will wait until we get to the portion of the programs where teachers are kind of providing their feedback and ideas. And then as part of the conversation, it tends to be more natural to bring it up then. And in terms of the state standards and things like that, we are, I would say, mostly connection, connecting to state standards about teaching of the visual arts. But then when we get into some things that are more specifically topical, if we're teaching about a special exhibition that has curriculum connections, then that may come up in conversation. So I hope that's answered some of your question, Melissa. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Uh, Hi. For your portion. Thank you. And I want to thank Teresa also for inviting Museum Hack to be part of this really interesting discussion on risk taking in uh, galleries. So I'll just give you guys a little bit of, whoops, my camera is getting a little wonky there. Um, I'll just give you guys a little bit of a background about what Museum Hack is, what we do. We are a private tour company that is based in New York City. Uh, we are a renegade tour company. That's kind of how we like to think of ourselves. And we give tours at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Nat Natural, hold on, American Museum of Natural History, AM and H. <laughs> and in those two particular spaces, that's kind of where we are based most prominently right now. We give tours that are uh, different, that are unique, that kind of dig out some of the hidden stories, the hidden meanings, um, some of the unique objects that are hidden in dark corners of the museum that a lot of people don't see. And, you know, but we also focus on a lot of highlights, on a lot of the things that are a big deal in the museum, uh, and then take it from a different perspective. Um, when you think of the word museum hack, I have people who ask me all the time, what does hack mean? What, you know, what does it mean to hack a museum? What does it mean to hack an object? Um, and our definition of a hack is to study the elements of a system, to understand the elements of a system so well that you're able to manipulate them to make something new or to make something that is unique. Um, so given that, we spend a lot of time doing in-depth research trying to figure out uh, what some of these stories are to give ourselves all of the tools that we need um, in order to give really innovative, entertaining, educational, and exciting tours of the museum. Uh, we're firm believers in the power of storytelling in order to engage audiences. And I think what's a little bit different in terms of museum hacking who are tar target audiences and what an institution, what institutions like actual museums themselves have, is that we tend to target audience members who we think, for some reason or another, have decided that museums aren't for them. You know, they might have gone when they were kids in elementary school. They might, you know, every once in a while go, you know, to a nightly event or something. But for the most part, you know, our, we're trying to pull people into the museum who don't usually go to the museum, who on a Saturday afternoon chooses, you know, to watch House of Cards on Netflix or to go to the mall um, or something like that rather than going into the museum and we want to show that the museum is in fact a viable and, and exciting 
a wonderful place to be spending your time and to be investing your resources. Um, so that's really kind of where the audience that we're looking at. Um, so I would say in many ways the risk taking that Museum Hack does is in fact the risk taking of pulling in people who, you know, come in a little bit cynical and, you know, aren't exactly sure they want to be there. You know, some get dragged by girlfriends or boyfriends and so, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I don't like museums. You know, and we love those people. We just, you know, we, we're, we immediately want to engage with them. Um, so a museum hack, uh, Michelle, can you just put up the second slide of this share? Michelle is also helping me out. Um, okay. So the first slide had my contact information, but you can see that on my little banner as well if you want to email me after with any questions. Um, so we do two things at Museum Hack. When we go into a museum, we really think, A, we're going to hack the content, and B, we're going to hack the experience of being inside of a museum. So here you see, I love this image. This is one of those images where we've arranged our uh, guests, our clients, into a tableau vivant, so a living painting of what it is that they're looking at. Uh, this usually comes at the end of us doing our presentation on what is George Washington crossing the Delaware. And I just think this is a really great example of hacking content because George Washington crossing the Delaware, if you grew up in the United States, we've all seen it. It's in our textbooks. It's often on the front cover of the textbook. It's on the Delaware Quarter. It's everywhere. Everybody has seen it. And when you've seen a highlight so many times, it kind of erases it for you. You just kind of walk by. You're like, oh, that's a nice painting. You keep walking. And we ask our guests to stop, to take a moment, and to just look. Look at the object. Look at the painting. What is being painted? What is being presented? What is the story? And then we just tell them, just tell us. What do you see, right? So we're really trying to emphasize close looking, but at a level where they really can just tell us what it is that they see. There's no like hidden objective here, just what is it that you see? And for a lot of them, the first thing that they notice is, oh my gosh, there are horses on a teeny tiny little boat. Or there are giant icebergs. I swear the Delaware River doesn't freeze over like that. And suddenly you begin to see that these observations are unpacking some of these larger questions that is making this very common, very often seen painting unique, different, unusual. And then from that point on, once we've started engaging them, then we go into the background of the, of the object, we go into the stories, we go into the fun things, and then we blow their minds, right? We tell them a, a faction of a, a part of a story that they may, might not have heard before. We focus on, to be totally honest, the cherries that are hanging out on George Washington's pants that a lot of people have never noticed before despite seeing the painting all the time. Um, and then, well, Michelle, do you mind going to the next image? So here we have a bunch of people who are literally, they've literally taken a knee because it is only from that position that you can see the halos in Duccio's Virgin and Christ. So it's, you know, we literally have them take a knee and it just completely blows their mind how from different perspectives a work of art looks different and you can notice different uh, details. You know, I mean, again, this is another format of close looking. And then Michelle, if you don't mind going to the next one. So one of the elements of the hack, right, one of the elements of hacking an object is, of course, making it connection, making it personal. Um, and for us, and definitely for me as an, you know, as an educator, as an art historian, um, as a museum lover, for me it's really about meeting the client where they are. Um, and so if you think about walking around New York City, um, Rachel, I'm sure you know this, you live in New York, and you know you walk around and you're just being jostled, you're bumping people, and I'm completely guilty of this. I have my phone on me at all times. I'm checking my email, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm looking for things to Instagram, I'm checking how many likes I have on my last Instagram photo. You know, and that's really kind of where our generation is. Um, that's part of, you know, who we are as technologically plugged in people. So why not, instead of telling people, put your phones away, you should be looking at the art, why don't we connect with them on that level, right? Why don't we encourage selfies like this lovely woman um, who is taking a, in fact, a very beautiful selfie. Um, why don't we give them the the scenarios, why don't we give them the opportunities to be able to post on Instagram, to look at something so carefully and to take a photo of a, of a little detail that they notice that's really interesting that we're then going to fold into a, a game or a gallery activity. And Michelle, if you go to the next photo. Uh, the other thing that we like to do, hold on, I'm getting a little out of control in terms of my Ah, yes. And so we're, so to finish up that point, you know, we're trying to meet people so that they can make that personal connection with a work of art. It's not just about, um, it's not just about coming in and being, and being told what to think, right? It's about literally having that personal connection inside of that space. Um, so the other facet of what Museum Hack uh, believes in is also 
hacking the experience, hacking the experience of being inside of a space. Um, during our tours, we take a lot of breaks. We'll, you know, stop for wine. We'll go to the cafe. If people are very clearly, you know, kind of flagging, museum fatigue is setting in. You know, we have certain tools that we use to combat these. Um, but part of it is also using the institution and what they offer. You know, it's not just Museum Hack that knows that museum fatigue exists. The Met knows it too. And the Met has various places inside of the museum that they call visual oases. And those spaces are spaces that incorporate art and incorporate culture, but do not necessarily have, like, here is a painting that you must look at, right? And so they're visual oases. They're moments for you to kind of take a breather, relax yourself a little, maybe have a seat, you know, and give yourself that moment of relaxation, of kind of reconnecting before you go back out into the galleries. And so at Museum Hack, we firmly believe in taking advantage of that. It's, you're not a bad person and an uncultured person for getting tired in a museum. It's a very normal thing that happens. You know, if you're tired or like you want a glass of wine before you go into the museum and look at the works of art, fine. That's what the cafes are there for. Um, and so we really want to experience that sort of, um, the museum is, is for you. The museum is there in order to show you the wonders of the art, in order to show you the wonders of the architecture that's around you. So take advantage of it, right? And, and really immerse yourself in that particular, particular scenario. Um, another way that we hack experience is by using games inside. And Teresa and Rachel, I have to say, you guys have some incredible ideas within the galleries. Like I'm very, I'm just so impressed and so inspired listening to some of the ideas that you have presented. Um, and we do something similarly. Well, we'll we'll look, we'll look at works of art and come up with some new ideas. We have a lot of theater people, uh, theater professionals who are part of Museum Hack, and they really bring a storytelling, innovative, ideas-focused uh, approach to teaching inside of the gallery, which has been very helpful for someone like me who's, you know, very art historically trained and kind of, you know, very classically trained. Um, and so they've given me a lot of different ideas and we share like that. Um, and if, let me see if, Michelle, if you can go to the next topic. So here's one of our, I love this photo, but they're, they're doing the T-Rex. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is an example of giving, uh, you know, people an opportunity to take a photograph and they can share it on Instagram and this, stuff like this gets so many likes, right? Um, but we talk a lot about hacking the experience in, uh, in being able to, you know, go into the galleries and see the galleries not as these temples of worship, but rather as places of engagement, right? And so we play games like Tour Flip, which a lot of museum educators do. I know that as well. Where, um, like, what some of what Teresa does in the in the uh, hammer or what Rachel is doing with her teachers in the Brooklyn is to really let them go into the galleries themselves and focus on the close looking themselves and then coming back together as a group and creating some sort of communal uh, community based engagement right but they're they're given that opportunity they're given the opportunity to look at the works on their own um, and so to wrap up that section of uh, hacking the experience, the other thing I do want to bring up is that concept of storytelling. Um, at Museum Hack, we put in a lot of focus on uh, what it means to convey information, what it means to communicate stories, uh, specifically stories about the art, about the institution itself, things like that. Um, and one of the greatest things about working at Museum Hack is for somebody like me, storytelling about art is writing an academic paper, which is very interesting to me. It's not so interesting to a lot of other people. Um, and so by being trained in storytelling, by having theater professionals surrounding me and showing me and teaching me that different ways of storytelling, I'm, I have a much more capable ability to engage people, whether it's in the galleries, whether it's in the uh, classroom, right? It just doesn't matter. In, in any kind of teaching capability, storytelling becomes super effective. Um, and these are hacking the content, hacking the experience are things that, you know, are transferable. You know, they apply to almost any museum. They apply to almost any gallery. And if you actually go back to the photo you were on, Michelle, if you don't mind. Thank you. So here's an example of uh, I am currently crowning my colleague Nora with an adaptive. And this is one of Franz Vest's adaptives. This is at the Williams College Museum of Art. Uh, WICMA had invited us to go and we hacked their museum, uh, we hacked their exhibitions, and we created an incredible itinerary of events and activities uh, with that. And here, you know, we're interacting with the adaptives. So these are works of art. They're reproductions, but they are still the works of art of Franz Vest adaptives. And you are meant to play with them. You are meant to interact with them. And so here's a couple educators from Mass MoCA 
uh, over here is Wikma, and then of course me and Nora on the side, you know, literally just playing and having a really good time with the objects themselves. And so that's one of the greatest things about working at Museum Hack for me is that I've had the opportunity and will continue to have the opportunity to go and explore different museums and, you know, different museums will hire us or invite us to hack their museum, hack their work, um, and to speak with their educators and their docents and their tour guides and create incredible experiences within all of these different various museums, which has been an incredible opportunity. Um, I think my time is about up. I might have gone over a little bit, so I will just wrap up there. And of course, this is we think that museums are fucking awesome. It's <laughs> the end of the day, that's what museum hack is. We think that museums are fucking awesome. So there's that. All right. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Michelle. So there are two questions that came up while you were sharing your portion. So um, I'll just start with the first one is, how do the museums that you are hacking feel about your presence? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's from Andrea, right? That's a very common yeah. question. Um, thank you for that question. I do appreciate that. Um, you know, it's interesting because for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is where I'm a tour guide, they have become incredibly supportive. Um, there's a lovely PBS documentary that they did about Museum Hack, and they, you know, interviewed the director of education, and she is. You know, they're not directly involved with our content per se, um, but she is aware of what it is that we are doing, and you know, is very supportive of us bringing in millennials or a particular audience uh, that might not necessarily go to the Met on their own, right, might not necessarily go on a normal basis. Um, in terms of other museums, uh, for instance, WICMA, they actually invited us, and so that's been a really interesting uh, experience is to see that other museums around the country and actually around the globe uh, in different countries have called us up um, and have wanted to understand what it means to hack a museum and have wanted us to come into their spaces to hack it. So in that case, they feel, I mean, I would think that they feel great about it. <laughs> so, and we love it. We think it's wonderful. So I hope that kind of answers your, your question. Yeah, and then related to that, um, Melissa's asking, um, how do you feel that your hacking activities differ from the programming being developed by the museums you are visiting? And then you already talked a little bit about how you, if you work with museum ed departments, but if you ever actively collaborate on specific programs. So one of the greatest, uh, one of, I think one of the best examples for that is what we did at WICMA, Williams College Museum of Art. We did work directly in connection with their museum education department. Um, and we also worked with museum education people from the Clark and people from MassMoCA as well. And so that was a really great experience for us. Um, at the Met and the AMNH, we do not work directly in connection with the museum education department, and when it comes to museum consulting, it really depends on what the museum themselves want. Um, that's to answer the second half of your question. Um, hacking activities differ from the programming being developed by the museums you are visiting. Yes. Okay. So, in all honesty, you know, it's a really good question. Sometimes they differ drastically. Sometimes they don't. It just really depends on the museum itself. I mean, you see here, Teresa and Rachel are representatives of two museums that in essence, create very innovative, boundary-pushing materials. Um, the, one of the benefits of being museum hack is that because we are not tied to an institution and because we are not necessarily tied to fundraising efforts, things like that, we're really able to push the boundaries wherever the boundaries are. Whatever the status quo is, we can push those, those boundaries. Um, they're different in the sense that we have a multiplicity of perspectives from our, our staff, um, from the people that muse that work for Museum Hack, that is different from, you know, what normally populates a museum education department. And so, from that experience, from that perspective, our hacking, right, is different from the programming that's being developed by museums. Um, sometimes they align, sometimes they diverge. It's you know, it it just really depends on the institution specifically. Okay. Great. Yeah, Thank you very helpful. much. Yeah, no, they were kind of two related. Also, yeah. someone wants to know where they can get that awesome t-shirt. <laughs> so you can, go, you can go to museumhack.com um, and in one of the blog posts, you know what, you can email me and I will send you the link. We do sell those t-shirts though. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, good. I think you brightened some folks' days. So thank you for asking that question, Christy, too. That's great. Um, okay, good. So we have about uh, 12 minutes left on this Hangout. So um, so we have a little bit more time if viewers have additional questions, or I know that um, Teresa has a question or two prepared that we can sure. ask one another, too. 
as we're waiting for clinic questions to come in, I was interested in hearing a little bit more from Rachel because, um, you know, not everyone has sort of a company mission or an institutional um, mission to to really put experimentation and innovation front and center. So um, if, if maybe Rachel could speak a little bit about how you could get started just innovating within your programmatic areas that you already uh, Sure. Um, I would say that that is one of the things I, I have started out um, so I have been in my current position, I've had a couple of different positions at the Brooklyn Museum and in my current position as teacher services coordinator, I've been doing this for a little over a year now. And when I first started, I was doing much less, I mean it's taken me a while to develop how much I want the balance to be in favor of experimentation and I would say my early programs, it really was sort of like, all right, some programs are going to be much more traditional style and I'm not going to try to come up with something brand new and exciting and super fun all the time. And what I started to do was, for example, I have one program that happens twice a year, which is um, some of the pictures that I showed earlier or that Michelle showed for me earlier um, are from that program and it's a large scale drop in open house experience. And so there's always been, we have curator talks, we have educators leading teaching experiences in the galleries, we have art making, we have snack, and those elements have always been there. And I'm not reinventing the wheel on those, but one thing that I started to do was adding in an option for a free choice, unexpected activity. So like a choose, let choose your own adventure or gallery bingo, that kind of thing. So it was really not changing the substance of the program, but just kind of adding in one little element and seeing how it goes. So that was, I, I would say that would be my suggestion for anybody thinking about that, is sort of start small. Don't try to reinvent the wheel from the get-go. And in a lot of respects, like, the, you know, not everybody wants that kind of experience when they come to an event. So if you've got something that's experimentation focused, it's an option and not everybody has to do it. And then if there are some things that are more traditionally focused, that's also an option. So I would say it's kind of finding the balance and, and bringing it in in little bits and then seeing maybe where it fits more and maybe where it fits less. Okay, great. And then that brought up a question which um, Mark is bringing up about what benchmarks or tools do you use to gauge success of your programs? And it looks like he was uh, interested in Michelle from Museum Hack, but I think it'd be a great question for all three of you to, to answer. But if you want to start, Michelle. You're, mu you're muted. You just, yep. Thank you, Google, for telling me that. That's great. Okay, um, I'm sorry. So, um, of course, we're not a muse you know, we're not a museum. We're not a museum ed, and so we don't necessarily have the same sorts of benchmarks or tools that a museum education department would have to gauge success. Um, but what we are uh, is we really have our focus and our priority are on our customers and our clients, the people who come on our tours, the museums who hire us. Um, so, honestly, 99% of our benchmark is feedback. It's customer feedback. It's the emails that we get, the reviews that we have posted on Yelp or on TripAdvisor, um, and what people are telling us. You know, when somebody writes us an email and says, "You know, that was the first time I went to a museum in 18 years, and it was amazing." You know, your my tour guide X, Y, and Z did X, Y, and Z that I thought was so engaging. Then we know that those things are particularly useful. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up a little bit earlier, and I forgot, was kind of our training process. So even though I'm a full-fledged tour guide, you know, I might want to work out new material or I want to try a new activity or something like that. Um, and instead of sort of just launching it into the public or launching it into my tours, you know, although I do try to take experimentation, but kind of like what Rachel says, sometimes you have to start, sl start small, start slow, because you never really know the effect of something completely new unless you test it out. And so at Museum Hack, we'll have friends tours. Um, and so friends tours will be, you know, we, we, advertise it to people who come on Museum Hack Tours a lot, or it could even be my friends and family, people who are not normal museum goers, people who are museum goers, people who are museum educators. We get a very diverse group of people to come on these experimental tours where I will try out new materials 
you know, on people who, you know, didn't pay the full admission, so to speak, you know, or pay the full ticket price, but can come and give me feedback. And then kind of like what you guys do, I will hand out surveys at the end of it and gauge what was successful, what was not successful, what I should keep, which I should, I should throw out, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the tools that we use that we have in our box um, to kind of work out and tease out the successes of, of different activities, different programs, et cetera. Great. Um, I can jump in. In terms of the Look Together program, I mentioned that we gave out surveys for that program. And one thing we did do is specifically ask um, about that impact statement and whether or not we were really, we put the impact statement on the survey and we asked if, you know, were, did they feel like they were experimenting? Were they engaging with one another and sort of self-reflecting uh, on that? Um, so, and, and now I think the proof is sort of in the pudding in that we are now maxing out with that program. So we're, while we're not doing the surveys anymore, we're still sort of checking in with families afterwards, um, anecdotally, and then, um, and then seeing how the program is sort of spreading through word of mouth. Through the Gallery Teaching Lab, we're not so interested in success. I mean, we're really more interested in experimentation. And so if it doesn't succeed, that's part of what we're trying to figure out. And I will say, kind of on a, on a similar note, some of the things that I am trying out with teachers may not work, and then I won't do them again. Um, what I try to do is have that balance so that in any given program, there may be an experimental element. And if it works, that's great. And if it works for some people, that's great. And if it doesn't work for everybody, that's OK. And if it doesn't work at all, hopefully there's another element of the program. Like part of the six. Oh, no. I feel like that's, that's like, you know, rebel, rabble rouser hat on a little bit with some of this stuff. And I think some of the success feels like, or, or I see success when it, people are trying something new. Great. Good. OK. Excellent. So we're getting close to the end of our time, so I just wanted to highlight a few things. I first wanted to thank Teresa, Rachel, and Michelle for joining us today and sharing uh, your risks, which are not always um, I don't know, sometimes we're a little precious with our work and sometimes we're not always willing to share how we're taking risks or trying out different things. So thank you all for sharing different examples and also for answering questions from the from the viewers. And I wanted to just remind everyone that NAEA Museum Education Division's peer-to-peer uh, -peer initiative takes place on the second Wednesday of every month at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Next month in April, uh, let's see, April 8th, I believe, yes, it's going to be focusing on teaching the teaching artists and what that training looks like, so stay tuned for more information about that. Also, before that happens, our annual convention for NAEA will be taking place in New Orleans um, from uh, March 25th through the 28th, and our lovely pre-conference for Museum Ed will be taking place on March 25th. So now's your opportunity to um, network and connect and share ideas with peers face-to-face -face with that peer-to-peer -peer networking. Also, um, the division has organized three sessions that will focus on gallery teaching um, that will be offered back to back on Friday, March 27th, um, starting at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, each of them starts with gallery teaching colon and then a specific audience or issue. So one is focusing on interge intergenerational audiences, another about standards, and then another about um, teaching outside the box or thinking about things a little bit differently, uh, specifically with adult audiences. Um, and then Rachel has been working on organizing something else that'll uh, be taking place. So um, before I turn it over to her for a quick plug on that, um, also we have an informal um, get together called Peer to Peer Happy Hour, which will happen Thursday, March 26th after the conversation with colleagues. So a lot of this information will be available on the NAEA Museum Education Division page of the website if you want to check out. Uh, more information there. But Rachel, if you wanted to give a quick plug for the other event, and you're still muted, so you might need to unmute. Yep. Um, I 
I don't want to give too much away because part of it is the the kind of surprise and enjoyment factor. But um, we are going to be meeting at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, and there that it's actually their evening opening hours anyway. So it will actually be for anybody attending NAEA, but also open to any members of the public who are at the museum. Um, also reaching out to students who are in New Orleans, any members of the community. So. We're going to be doing it's we're we're calling it a museum throwdown mashup. Um, it's not going to require any sort of preparation. So feel free to come if you would like to experiment with some teaching ideas. Feel free to come if you would like to be a supportive audience member for other people's experimental teaching ideas. We've got some museum educators who are definitely signed on to teach. Um, and then we have other people who we're just going to see who wants to teach on the night. And it's all going to be um, sort of about trying things out without a lot of preparation, without a lot of pressure, and just having some time to experiment and play. So we should have some more information going up on uh, artmuseumteaching.com about that event pretty soon. And um, hopefully, and it's right across the street from the peer-to-peer -peer happy hour which is also that night. So feel free if you want to go and get a drink and feel loosened up and then come over and experiment. <laughs> that might be a nice pairing. Or if you want to do it the other way around, you could do that too. <laughs> it's a different, different kind of gallery risk taking. Uh, yes, so that's great. Excellent. Thank you all three again for sharing your ideas and giving us something to think about as we, a bunch of us, are about to um, convene in New Orleans to share ideas in person. And thank you all for coming in and hope you'll join us again in April. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye.